Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. I'm pleased to welcome to our program today two guests, Sholpan Primbatova and Tara McCrimmon. Ms. Primbatova graduated from our master's program in 2009 and is currently Deputy Director of the Global Health Research Center of Central Asia in Almaty, the largest city in Kazakhstan. Ms. McCrimmon holds degrees from the Columbia School of Public Health and also SIPA, and is the project director for two Almaty-based studies looking at how we can apply existing research on HIV, STDs, migration, women, and violence to the needs of vulnerable groups in Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Ms. Primbatova and Ms. McCrimmon, welcome to Social Impact Live. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the projects that you're involved with, but um, for me and also for our audience, I'd like to just paint a picture of Kazakhstan, if you could, and just tell me a little bit um, about uh, the country, the area, and, and your personal connection to it. Sure. Just, okay. 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 Kazakhstan is the heart of Eurasia. It's um, the ninth biggest country in the world by mm. territory. There's only 17 million people mm. living there. Yeah, we were part, we used to be the part of the Soviet Union, but now we are an independent country. Mm -hmm. And we are um, affiliated with Columbia University. Our center is affiliated with Columbia. Okay. Uh, Tara? Yeah, um, the only thing I would add is uh, the reason that Kazakhstan is a very relevant place for doing a lot of our research is because of the, the HIV epidemic there and a lot of the related epidemics. Um, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia is one of the, I think it's the only region in the world where HIV incidence is still increasing. Um, okay. Historically, this has been driven by uh, injection drug use. Um, Kazakhstan sits, you know, right above Afghanistan, so it's along a lot of the drug trafficking, drug trafficking routes. Um, and also just the kind of the social, economic, political upheavals that happened with the fall of the Soviet Union um, led to kind of widespread injection drug use. Um, but now we're also seeing really a shift in the epidemic. So it's uh, very much uh, shifting from an epidemic uh, driven by injection drug use to one driven by, um, uh, by sexual, a, sexual transmission. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, December 1st was World AIDS Day, right? Yes. Just recently. And, and so there is, even though worldwide a decrease in AIDS-related deaths, um, HIV infection and AIDS-related deaths have been increasing in, in Kazakhstan recently? or what? Um, I'm not sure about AIDS-related deaths as much mm. as the number of new HIV cases oh. per year. That okay. is on the increase, despite a lot of a lot of efforts and a lot of great improvements that have been made. Um, so. And Almaty signed the Paris Declaration to struggle with HIV, and we are following the UNAIDS uh, strategy 1999 to, to achieve um, the goals uh, till 2030. Okay, so so through the uh, Global Health Research Center, and I, are you receiving um, support from government partners, or where does where does the support come from? Um, a lot of the funding that we receive is um, NIH funded, uh, mm. mostly through NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Okay. Um, there are also additional uh, partners yeah. that we've worked with in the yeah, past. Yeah, we receive funds from the local government for the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education and Science, and and now we are working with the UK-based um, Elton John Foundation on AIDS, oh. and we're receiving funds from them as well. Okay, so there's there's cooperation on both sides. It looks like um, to work on on this problem of HIV infection uh, in Kazakhstan. And just generally speaking, I mean, is it a is it a rural country? I mean, what's the economy like? Is it industrial, agricultural? <laughs> yeah, so it's um, the mix of uh, ag agriculture, yeah. we have a rural area because Kazakhstan is mountain steps, we don't have access to water, okay. so it's, uh, we have a lot of rural area, it's like open space. Mm. And few cities who are like cosmopolitan cities. Okay, so so there are some so cities, and Almaty being the largest city and formerly a capital. Yeah, it yeah. used to be the capital. Now we have Nur Sultan as a capital of okay. Kazakhstan. And and the economy, from what I understand, there's there's uh, uh, oil production and uh, I assume some manufacturing, but also a, a lot of mining and 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 it's, so on. So. Yeah. Feeding steel, into the economy. copper, they have a lot of natural natural resources. resources. Are all, are okay. All, all right. So, um, so we've got an issue, I guess, um, with HIV infection that um, you know, you're working on um, different projects um, together. 
Um, uh, Tara, and, and your first entry into this field? I mean, if you could tell us how you got into sure. this kind of work? Um, so I kind of came to the Global Health Research Center of Central Asia in kind of a roundabout way with my combined interest in public health and working in the region. Um, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I served in the Peace Corps for three years in Ukraine, and that was um, kind of my, my introduction to, um, you know, the former, former Soviet region, and it also really sparked my interest in public health. Health. And so I came back to the United States to get my degree. And when I graduated, um, I was looking for global health work that I could be doing in the in the region. And really, this center is one of the one of the few. I think I mean the only um, one in Kazakhstan that's doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. We so. consider to be center of excellence for doing the research. We are very strong in research. Mm -hmm. And Star said we are the only one, the center scientific center in the Central Asia region. Okay, so. So this is a perfect entree into uh, discussing maybe one of the projects that you've been working on together. Um, the, uh, there, there's one that's uh, targeting uh, women, I think, um, who are at high risk for HIV infection. Is the NOVA protocol? Yes, is that, exactly. what, how does that work? Uh, so NOVA is an intervention. It's a combination HIV prevention and microfinance intervention um, that we're testing among women who have um, kind of a dual risk of HIV, both from uh, working in sex work and also from drug use. Mm -hmm. uh, not only injection drug use, but drug use in general. Um, so um, it's an intervention. We're testing the effects of um, uh, a, this combination intervention that includes both HIV prevention, kind of a, a classic HIV prevention training, um, and then the control group of participants only receives that. The experimental group receives that, and they receive additional micro uh, microfinance components. So they mm -hmm. receive um, financial literacy training, they receive vocational training, um, and then they receive a, a match savings fund that's supposed to um, help them um, potentially build a build up a, a new career capacity. Um, yeah, and mm -hmm. those women who are employ unemployed, and like we wanted to provide the alternative to their sex work, so they wanted to get rid of the, their past experience in commercial sex work and to be more to increase self esteem and to be more sustainable. So we provided them the way how they can build their own business. Mm -hmm. And what Tara said, if this training and the match saving, they got funds, so some of them opened a small salon of hairdressing, some of them started to do like song courses, so like um, makeup sessions, so they, some, yeah, they okay. could have, they, they, actually we gave yeah. them opportunity to start a new life. Oh. And NOVA is an example of, you know, an intervention that really we adapted, um, the original, uh, we did a, a project was done here uh, called Worth, um, and mm -hmm. that was what we adapted. Um, and made uh, made that into the protocols for Nova. So it really it was taking work that had been done here in the United States and applying it to a completely new context in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I have more questions, but I need to remind our audience that uh, we will reserve the last 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you've got questions, please write them in, and uh, our manager will get them to us um, uh, towards the end of today's program. So, so uh, let me see if I'm following you. Uh, so we've, there are different interventions that have been tested, uh, sort of looked at and, 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 and shown to be effective in other parts of the world that you're trying to adapt and, and apply to Kazakhstan, right, to help reduce HIV um, infection uh, among women who are at high risk for because of sex work, because of maybe drug use and so on. Not so much that uh, focusing on the, on the public health aspect, but more you know general socioeconomic empowerment. Is is that kind of the idea there? Yes, definitely behind the microfinance um, yeah. components in Probably particular. Um, yeah, and also um, yeah, working very closely with the communities, um, kind of engaging the communities in this work. Mm. Mm -hmm. So so as a U.S. trained uh, researcher and, uh, and and practitioner. I mean, what was it like for you to sort of take something that's been developed here in the United States or in Western countries and then show up in Kazakhstan <laughs> and then start working working there? It, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of kind of adaptation, pilot testing, pilot testing um, yeah. a lot of building up 
local buy-in that's not only from uh, community members, as we mentioned, but also from local uh, government, medical, social service stakeholders as well. So we really rely on a, a very wide-ranging groups of people, group of people to get this work done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, the, I think, probably the most important thing, uh, first step in any, any of the projects Anything, that we yeah. do is kind of getting that buy-in, getting everyone on board. So what Tara mentioned, the pilot is very important. Before we started to be big projects, we always do pilot with smaller sample, mm -hmm. and we go through the language how we will ask. So it's not only translating the protocols from English to Russian and Kazakh language, but it's adapting the language. How even can you approach people? How you can ask questions? Mm. So it's a lot of stakes like adaptation, not just the translating from. And then taking into consideration mentality, tradition, conservatism, so like uh, like uh, considering the views of all key stakeholders. Yeah. So this is how we do first piloting, then see the results of the pilot, and then we start bigger. Projects. Yeah, no, I, I imagine, I mean, it's difficult enough um, for us here to talk about sex and sex work and things like that, and then, right, sort yeah. of going yeah. into the field. Can you give me an example of some of the, you know, kind of adjustments or uh, uh, accommodations you had to make in order to, to sort of use the material um, that that uh, um, you're trying to apply? So basically when you wanted to interview a woman mm. from the family, uh, sometimes like in the States you, you keep uh, confidentiality so she should be the only one in the room. Right. In our community sometimes like no, my husband should be in front of me or my mother-in-law should be present. So, so it's this like boundaries um, like keeping confidentiality mm -hmm. issues so this was the tricky uh, for us in the beginning yeah. yeah but it's great that through our project we teach communities mm -hmm. we bring these ethical principles to our research in Kazakhstan mm -hmm. and somehow this is how we train staff research staff and the communities mm -hmm. yeah I mean we, in, in social work practice, we generally try to protect the privacy of our individual clients, but there may be other cultural values that, you know, put a premium on relationships, right, yeah. familial and otherwise, um, and, and making sure that you're not uh, yeah. undermining uh, those things as well, so. Or oh, Tara will speak about the bridge project, for example, we have uh, trust points where um, drug users come for screening, mm -hmm. and if there is, uh, after the bio-testing, bio if the results are positive, the nurse should speak about his result tete -a -tete. Yeah. But if he comes with a group of friends, right. like everybody sitting and listening, what mm -hmm. is what's the result of the test. So, so what is that, that like? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was really challenging. I know we haven't talked about the bridge project yet, but yeah. that was one of our big challenges that we're supposed to uh, be introducing um, this idea of confidential HIV testing. And um, what we ended up with was networks of uh, friends uh, in these communities of people who inject drugs that all felt more comfortable coming to this medical setting together because it's you know setting that in the past they've experienced stigma with they're um, you know just very uncomfortable there they much prefer to come as a group and then it just became challenging for our staff that we had trained to you know make everyone else sit out in the hallway where one at a time calling people in mm -hmm. it was just yeah we had to think on our feet make adaptations um, to you know, adhere to our study protocols while also honoring and working with kind of these yeah. existing cultural mm -hmm. norms. Okay, um, so backing up a little bit to what exactly is or was the Bridge Protocol? Yeah, right. that you uh, were doing. So Bridge is a um, it's an intervention for people who inject drugs. Mm. Um, it's run in um, what are referred to as trust points. Basically, they're syringe exchange programs mm -hmm. or harm reduction centers, and okay. um, they're um, meant as a place where injection drug users can receive, um, they can receive clean syringes and needles, they can receive anonymous HIV testing, referrals to other services, and these are, they're very community-based, they're um, in poly clinics kind of spread throughout the entire city, um, and the idea is that we want to work to kind of build up their capacity not only to bring in new clients but also then to uh, refer those clients who are HIV positive and link them to care at the, the HIV clinic, the, the AIDS center, which is a kind of more separate siloed organization. There's only one per city. Um, so we thought that because of the community um, you know, location of these trust points, they're really the, the best point at which we can conduct outreach, conduct HIV testing, and then do a case management intervention that will encourage 
clients to link to HIV care. Okay, so there's case management again. Uh, there's working with local providers uh, in the healthcare system and so on, but also within the community, community-based organizations and so on as well? Uh, yes, some of, some of these syringe exchange programs or, or trust points are actually run out of NGOs. Um, so okay. they, all of them work with outreach workers who are, you know, peers who do recruiting efforts and um, so that it's very, yeah, very deeply rooted in the community. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned cities, I mean, is this across the whole, I mean, how big of a project is this? Uh, so Bridge is being run in three cities. It's a stepped wedge design. Um, so uh, we began, uh, we began every city is slightly um, at different steps. Um, okay. So we first began in Almaty, our main city, and then we began in uh, two twin cities in the north of Kazakhstan, uh, Temertau and Karaganda, which we consider a single site because they share an administration, they share um, most resources. Um, and then our final site was Shimkent in the south. Mm -hmm. um, so we really are very much spread out across the entire entire country. And are there significant differences between North and South in Kazakhstan? I've, and does that affect the work that you're doing? In climate, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in culture, and too. And cultural and mentality. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, every side has its own um, peculiarities. Mm -hmm. And, and the, that's why we build the infrastructure. We come to the sites. We build our partnership infrastructure. Uh, establish com close partnership with the local government mm -hmm. and yeah each site it's each site is unique mm -hmm. yeah. okay um, uh, we have uh, some questions that maybe we can uh, start to field now um, you said you get NIH, NIH money to support your work in Kazakhstan but are you able to raise money locally or is sex work too stigmatized yeah, it's a good question. Mm. Yeah, sex work is very stigmatized. And even when we were implementing our NOVA project, we had some comment like, why are we doing it? Mm. Like, like, why do we have to like, um, implement these studies? Yeah. We raise money locally from the local governments, uh, Minister of Health, Minister of Education. Okay. We uh, fundraise and local sponsors of Kazakh in Kazakhstan, they mm -hmm. help us a lot. So I think it's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, Tara, you've been involved in assisting with the opioid study that Professor Nabila El Basel is leading here in New York State. Is there any overlap between what Dr. El Basel is doing with her research team here and what you're doing in Kazakhstan? Um, are the challenges uh, similar? Uh, and I also want to know how are the two settings different? So, um, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, they, they are they are different projects. Um, the ones that in we're doing in Kazakhstan definitely have more of an HIV emphasis than the right. healing community study here. Um, I think that there are some challenges that are very universal when it comes to uh, drug use and injection drug use in particular. A lot of those having to do with um, uh, stigma, um, the challenges of working with multiple systems and multiple players, you know, many of whom are just simply slow to change mm -hmm. um, for um, you know, often very good reasons, but um, it is sometimes challenging. There's a lot of uh, kind of systemic structural barriers that we run into in doing this work. I, so. I guess the big question is, I mean, can we take what we know about working with social problems here in the U.S. or you sort of um, industrial uh, countries like the U.S., right, and 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 apply it in in lower and middle income countries. I mean, it, is is culture too big of a barrier? And and and, and in some way, I mean, are we kind of like forcing, um, you know, certain solutions? I, I I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you can give me your thoughts about it. Yeah, it's a good question because it. the U.S. is a very diverse yeah. community. Like in this, in Kazakhstan, mm. we have more than 100 ethnicities living there. So it's I like know. we are diverse as well in our way. Okay. So whatever we bring from the states, like we bring like know-how mm -hmm. the best. Yeah. So as we said, we adapt, and it's really it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In harm reduction, in community engage, community engagement. This is the best model. How we work with the community. How this empower the community. How we can motivate people for changes and mm. how we change their behavior. These mm. models, are, this is very good interventions. And after they implement the studies, we package and bring to the government. So the, the, the government in Kazakhstan and other Central Asian countries, they can use in their state programs. Mm -hmm. Because we 
pilot, we implement, we bring the results and show this is the evidence-based practice, what mm -hmm. we do, this is works yeah. based on our research. And yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I would also just add. I very much agree with what Shopan's saying, but also add on um, that. I, I, you know, we should also be thinking about what are we learning in Kazakhstan that we can bring back to the United States mm -hmm. as well. I, I don't like point. thinking of it as a, just yes. a one-way direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, and are there things that we're picking up, um, learning from from the experience in Kazakhstan? Um, I definitely think so. I definitely think um, we, as a research team, a lot of the, um, you know, our. our methods or protocols that we work with like certainly inform some of the work that we're doing here um it's uh, in the healing yeah, yeah we um we've learned yeah to work in a very multidisciplinary way in kazakhstan and that's um uh, a lot of that obviously we apply to here as well in our work okay so. and, and certainly working with the community right yes. uh, as well um Another question, although sex work is often stigmatized, are there skills that women acquire in the realm of sex work that are transferable to other livelihoods? Hmm. Mm. Uh, yeah, sex work is very stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them who we work with were young ladies who came from rural areas to bigger cities right. to apply for universities. They didn't got the scholarship, for example, we started to work as a um, as um, unskilled labor, like using the unskilled, as unskilled labor, and somehow they were involved in social work. Mm -hmm. So majority of them whom we interviewed, all of them said, like, this is not our dream work here. Right. Or because of the gender-based violence, many of them who exchange um, sex for drugs or mm -hmm. just for food or just some simple cash money, so um, with the program, with our intervention, we change their money that they can own money, but not with their body, but with their mind and skills, mm -hmm. and that's why we give them new opportunity. Yeah. Mm. And I add on to that, you know, just just to be clear, like we are. Um, we do very much value and uh, work with a harm reduction approach. We're mm -hmm. not forcing women to leave sex work. We're simply giving them alternative uh, opportunities for income should they choose to. Mm -hmm. And um, like Chopin is saying, the majority of the women who we work with do imagine, you know, uh, pursuing some alternate form of, mm -hmm. um, of earning money. Yeah, I guess one of the premises is that if they have alternate forms then uh, of, of, of earning money, then that'll reduce the amount of money that they're getting from sex, and I guess by extension, the amount of work that they're doing in sex work, right? Um, and, and, and I don't know, have you seen indications that that's the case, or, uh, or do people just want to make as much money as they can, right? So it doesn't really, you know, one comes out of the other, but rather... Well, um, we, one of the things that we did notice that kind of touches on that is the sex workers that we're targeting, and part of this is just simply that we have two eligibility criteria. They must be involved in sex work and they must be involved in drug use. Mm -hmm. um, there are some sex workers, more kind of high end, who technically would meet our criteria for drug use as well, um, but they're working in much higher ranking, like nightclubs, more private events, and they won't even, you know, approach our recruiters mm -hmm. there. They hear our compensation amount that we're, we give to participants and say, like, why would I spend my time doing that? You <laughs> actually give them money. Uh, well, like any research study, we compensate participants okay, for their yeah. for their time and attending sessions, doing surveys that they can use to whatever match. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. for those purpose. in the uh, treatment or the experimental arm, um, we encourage them to put it into a saving a, a savings account, which we would then match and use towards a, um, a purchase related to um, something mm -hmm. in a different vocation for hairdressing, sewing, mm -hmm. manicure, pedicure courses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Are there risks for sex workers in approaching you and identifying as a sex worker? Oh, yeah. If so, how do you mitigate the risks? I would imagine that, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's criminalization, you know, police and, and so on. So how, how does that work? We have amazing, amazing field staff, um, very well-trained recruiters who we've used for this project, and also mm. for, for Bridge as well with injection drug users. There's obviously a lot of the same risks and issues. Right. Um, um, we really try to recruit field staff that are from the communities that we are working with in these studies, um, and they are really best trained in, um, we, we provide, you know, more of the study-related training, but they really provide the insight into the best places for recruitment, the best methods. Um, 
And I read what Tara said, so we never um, mentioned that the NOVA project is for sex workers. We always, in our website, in marketing, in our uh, presentation, it was the project for women in hard, difficult situations. Mm -hmm. and like, that's why we did mention the it, it, yeah, sex right. works yeah. and in order not to stigmatize the but, women who visit our field office. But obviously, in more private conversations, you're able to figure out who yeah, qualifies. Because some women didn't consider them as the sex workers. They mm. just exchange sex work for drugs or for money. And that's see. why it was not to be offensive to them. Mm -hmm. We just accepted they were in very difficult life mm -hmm. situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so, follow up, is there a movement to decriminalize sex work in Kazakhstan similar to the movement here in the U.S.? Um, I would say not, perhaps not as strong. I mean, to clarify, sex work itself, the actual um, sex workers themselves are not criminalized. Okay. Um, and other things surrounding sex work are. Um, so for, I don't yeah. know if you want to say more about this, but um, like, Running, running a, a brothel or sauna or whatever the location is, that is a criminal offense. And, okay. But that being said, a lot of the uh, time sex workers are simply harassed and arrested by policemen under the charges of an administrative violation, yes. which is a very broad term, <laughs> very, yeah. very undefined. Yeah, and, I agree um, with that, yes. Yeah, there are, there are advocacy groups that are working. I don't think it's kind of picked up steam in the way that the movement is, I don't think it's as widespread as the movement here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there plans to apply the Kazakhstan models to other countries in Central Asia where HIV is also on the rise? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, we, are part of, we have a representative, not, they are the center of this uh, Global Health Research Center of Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So we have the uh, regional office in Almaty in Kazakhstan, but also we have representative in Kyrgyzstan, neighboring country, in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. And one of the recently graduated alumni is from Uzbekistan. So the issues are almost similar. Mm -hmm. So it's good. And we have, we have been doing project in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan as well. Okay. And in Tajikistan, because it's crossroads from Afghanistan and opioid trafficking is very accurate. We had project in Tajikistan for overdose, for migration, for TB studies, as well as in, in Kyrgyzstan. So the mentality is almost the same. The, uh, our independence in the collapse of Soviet Union. So we grow being independent at the same time, and we are almost the same societies. It's wonderful. So your research center is, is, is the leader, right, yes. uh, locally. Um, to help, um, you know, make these uh, programs available and because they work, yep. right? right? It is, yeah. 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 Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm appreciative of both of you coming into the program today, especially you, Thank you, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, right in time. <laughs> uh, That concludes today's episode. We'll be joined next week by Professor uh, uh, Yamile Marti for our final episode of the fall 2019 season. Uh, we'll be continuing the discussion on global social work by discussing how to bring an international perspective to social work education. So until then, have a great week and see you next time. Bye-bye.